Well, first off, thank you very much for the invitation to present to you today. Um, I'm going to do a bit of an overview of the work I've done in collaboration with a variety of other people on the concept of incidental take, but I'm also going to take us into the area of what I call legacy effects. What I'm trying to do with this is evaluate sort of the magnitude of risk to bird populations that we're seeing from different kind of scope of context. And what I mean by that is, you know, how important are, is incidental take versus legacy effects? And in, within incidental take, what are the biggest priorities we need to start thinking about? So the first thing I'm going to do today is admit my sins as an ornithologist. How many birds have I killed? Okay. Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about my research on window collisions, how we've gotten the data that we've got, what it's told us, and compare that to the effects of forestry, which I've studied a lot. I'm going to go into some of the limitations of our science, what we maybe need to work on a little bit more if we really want to answer some of these questions about how many birds are being killed by a certain activity and is it important that we manage it specifically. And I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe some different approaches we might take with forestry as an example, and as well about road maintenance. So incidental take. I mean, I think everybody has a pretty good idea of what this means in this room, but birds are a key component of the Canadian biodiversity, about 450 species in the country that are native. And birds and nests and eggs are protected under the Migratory Bird Convention Act. Conserving migratory birds means we need to work on protecting their breeding habitat. It's not the only thing we need to do by far. We need to worry about migration. We need to worry about wintering grounds. But here in Canada, our responsibility is to worry about the breeding grounds because breeding is important. Migratory birds obviously can be disturbed directly by our activities if we do it when they're here. When they're gone, we also have effects. And we cannot ignore that. That is a reality I want to point out very, very strongly through this talk. But when we inadvertently kill or harm or do some kind of damage to birds, that is what we're going to talk about today, which is incidental take. Incidental take is a concern because, and this is, I want to emphasize this, we think it has an effect on populations. But the scientific evidence that we have a large impact or a small impact is something that we're still actually working on. Okay? And I'm going to highlight sort of what we do and don't know. So here's the answer to my t title. I killed 159. Okay, I've killed 140 so far. And what I mean by that is window collisions, I actually have studied this in my house at Sherwood Park for the last 16 years. I have a house that actually birds hit the windows too damn much and I've been trying to fix it. And I've actually killed 29. So that's a big number in my opinion. Um, the past houses I lived in, I didn't have as much, but I used the data that I collected to estimate that I probably killed 15 in my childhood prior to that. Hunting, my dad gave me a pellet gun when I was a kid and said, go get rid of the house sparrows in the barn. So I shot six and told him this was a pointless waste of time. I'm not doing it anymore. So that's probably where my conservation started. <laughs> I've run over three birds in my life that I can remember. The sage, uh, the, I was going to say sage grouse. I didn't kill a sage grouse, I promise. <laughs> I ran over a rough grouse really bad. Mowing, I've killed three. Um, I trimmed my shrubs one day and a bunch of chipmunk sparrow and um, Chipping sparrow jumped out of the nest and died. As a kid, I had two urban cats. They each lived 15 years. On average, each cat kills 2.8, so they probably killed 84. So that's my 140. Now, I haven't talked about the fact I own a farm and we cleared the land. I haven't talked about my house, which is about half a hectare in land that's been cleared. So once I account for that, it's going to be a bigger number. So I've done due diligence. I'm going to probably kill 19 in the rest of my life. And the reason being, my kid's new cat doesn't go outside. Massive effect. That's my due diligence. I've made a huge improvement with that alone. I changed the feeders in my yard or I reconfigured them, so I should reduce my window collision rate down to about 15 is my estimate. Car collisions, if I drive 24,000 kilometers a year, I'm probably going to get about three more. Um, hunting, I've decided to let birds poop where they want, so no more. And I don't have time to do yard work anymore, so I... <laughs> None. So my yard's horrible. I'm going to have huge productivity, but they'll, <laughs> but they'll probably run into the windows. Now, these are very back of the envelope. That's the envelope there. But let's do it another way, OK? I've used 700 pounds of paper in the past um, four to six years of my life, OK? Each year, and that's important. That takes about 135 trees to produce the paper that I needed. And that takes about half a hectare. 80 to 100 year old Aspen in Alberta. So that's about how much land I'm responsible for for my paper usage alone. I'm a good Albertan. I only use oil sands gas, 
we've cleared 895 square kilometers for the mines, so, but we're producing 83 million liters of gas per day in those mines. I burned 65,000 liters of fuel since I got my license. Okay, I speed a little bit, so it might be more than that, but so that's only about 0 0.006 of a hectare lost due to me, okay? Now, if I take the average nest, dense, nest density and the fact there's about a 25% chance that my nests are gonna be destroyed during summer harvest or you know, clearing by the oil sands, I probably killed zero birds by this. I probably destroyed about 0.7 of a nest and the number of adults lost to the population was 0.1. Again, due diligence, I bought a hybrid, I use recycled paper now, so I probably reduced those by half. So from my perspective, the things I need to fix was my cats and my windows. These other things are important, and I'm gonna show why they're important, but from the perspective of incidental take and me as an individual, I think that's part of the conversation we need to start having. So where do these, nests, these numbers actually come from? I didn't completely make them up back of the envelope. I mean, they come from a 2013 review in the journal Avian Conservation and Ecology, where myself and a variety of other scientists from Environment Canada and Climate Change wrote a whole series of papers. I have three in this issue with colleagues from ECC, where what we did is we looked at all of the literature we could find. We brought it together on all of the topics. So it was mining, it was pipeline development, it was energy development, it was forestry, it was cats, it was the whole nine yards. And we converted all of these numbers using a variety of statistical techniques, techniques that I will point out, um, where we found about two million nests destroyed per year, and we converted that into actual adult mortality. What was lost to the fall flight from incidental take from these various protests? And our estimate is a conservative 269 million birds lost per year from our activities in Canada. The US has done something similar. They have a much larger population. It's a significantly larger number for them. Importantly, the top five are predation by cats, collision with windows, collision with vehicles, collision with electrical lines, and mortality from pesticides, okay? Now, scientific uncertainty was replete throughout this entire discussion, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what we have to learn about. So I'll just emphasize a couple things. So this is the window study. So the window study was done. Um, a lot of the data in there came from, you know, reports of other people's papers all over, but the main one was from some research we did in Edmonton where we engaged people to measure the number of birds that were hitting the windows of their house. We did it in two ways. First, we asked, what do you remember? And to be honest, it actually works pretty well. I remember exactly how many birds I ran over with my car. I bet you if we asked most of you, you could probably remember how many times you've hit a bird with a car. And we can actually use that data to figure out approximately what's going on. And so we did this, and we also had people, another subset of people, go around their house every single day for an entire year. And what we got were patterns that looked like this. We found that rural areas had higher collisions. Rural areas with bird feeders had even higher collisions. Urban areas, um, urban houses, they, as the houses got older, they got more collisions, and feeders were a big influence. What we can do with that, though, is we can now take those patterns and we can look at, okay, well, what's the big magnitude? So you've probably all heard about, you know, the Toronto skyscrapers that kill hundreds of birds every year. It is a big deal. The average house kills 0.5 to 1 bird per year. The difference is, if we look here, there's the whopping total of 6,200 tall buildings in Canada. There's 10.1 million houses. So even though 100 birds might get killed at the average skyscraper, there's only 6,200 of them. There's 10.1 million houses. The houses win out bar none. What this shows is basically the category of house. No feeder, the percentage of the, in, the incidental take created by urban houses with no feeder. It's actually the biggest one because that's the most dominant thing in the landscape. So this is about trying to figure out how we prioritize you know, what, what we're gonna count. What this shows here, this is a histogram that shows sort of the potential range of what is possible for bird window collision death. Um, and how this works, I'll walk it through with the forestry example, but we take all the data and we do what's called randomization. And we take different parameter estimates from different studies, we throw them into the model, we get an estimate. We do that tens of thousands of times using these different parameters to see how sensitive is the model. And again, in bird window collisions, it's around 22 million. The US estimate's around 225, 300 million. Now, one of the things that's controversial about the bird window thing is it's way up there. It's one of the highest. But what gets killed? And so there's some question about, well, are we just killing a bunch of house sparrows, a couple of robins, right? Is that what windows are killing? And the answer to that depends on where you are. In Edmonton, yes, it's mostly house sparrows. It's some chickadees. It's species that are pretty much urban adapted. 
But in other parts of the range, particularly in the eastern seaboard and around Toronto, those kind of places, it's a lot of migratory birds from the boreal, things that are coming south and they're dying on migration. So let's go to forestry. Okay, so forestry, there's about a million hectares of forest harvested annually in Canada every year. It varies. And exactly how much of it is harvested in the summer, we don't really know. Somewhere between about 12 to 26 percent. And these just show us over time sort of the amount of land that's being, you know, um, cleared. Now, Nicole Barker is going to talk a lot more about this in detail, about the process that we use to do this. And I apologize for the small tables. But what we have to do is take into account uncertainty. So here we have two different ways of measuring densities of bird. One's called um, maximum detection distance, which is what's used by Partners in Flight. The other one's what's called EDR, which is an approach used by the Boreal Avian Modeling Project. We take those numbers. Those are density estimates. We have real data for that. We can estimate how many nests then there are based on the number of pairs that are out there. We can look at the amount of forest that there is in any given part of the country, whether it's conifer or deciduous. And then we can take that, convert those, into numbers of nests. And the basic take home, and I'll walk you through this a little later, is it depends on your method, right? Your method has an influence on the number we think, but it's as anywhere from 655,000 nests to as many as 2 million. We don't know for sure what it is, but it's somewhere in there. Now, how we did this for this whole review is what we did, though, is we wanted to convert this not just to nests, because let's just back up for a second. Nests is one thing, but Nests fail all the time. 50% of nests will be destroyed by a predator at any given instant. And so that has to be taken into account. Birds re-nest. Birds sometimes make it out of the nest. I'm going to show some examples of that in just a second. So what we wanted to do is convert it into the number of individuals that are lost from the fall flight, because that's really what we want to know, how much productivity are we losing. So what we do is we take the area disturbed and we look at the proportion of the habitat that was likely disturbed in the summer by the forestry activity. We take the different density estimates in the different habitats. We then put those together in what's called a bootstrap. Now, we add into that what's the average clutch size. How many nests are birds likely to have? How likely are they to survive? How likely are the juveniles to survive? And what we do is we do that tens of thousands of times, and we get this distribution. And approximately 900,000 birds are lost, probably due to the act of forest harvesting from the fall flight. Okay, so you now that gives us some context, right? 900,000 individuals, 22 million. Okay, so we're putting that in context of what's going on. Now this table highlights the results from that review, and all of, for reference, for those of you who aren't, you know, um, don't have a library access at a university. Avian, the journal Avian Conservation Ecology is actually online and open access, so you can get all of the papers that are here, and that reference will show you where to go. But what I want to highlight, this is in terms of equivalent number of adults lost. This is what we came up with as a total, 268 million per year are lost from these human activities. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but what I want to highlight, my cat is a big issue. My windows are a big issue. Pesticides are a big issue. Road vehicle collisions. These things that I do as an individual are a very big deal. Forestry's up there. It's right there. Okay. And when we work our way down, though, we start to see that you know, the magnitude of the effect of what is being lost changes. And I think this is what we've got to start looking at is, what are we going to do for each one of these things? And where do we want to invest, our, what, invest what I call our conservation capital? What is the big problem we should fix first? So, loss of individuals due to adult and juvenile mortality um, seem to be, in this review, a big deal. The loss of nests is important, but it's less of a magnitude of an effect of the actual loss of individuals. The composition of the species is something that we do need to look at, um, but there are migratory hotspots I'm particularly concerned about, and there always are going to be local phenomena, places where we're doing something that's really bad for some group of species. And I mean, you know, obviously, like long-length fisheries. It happens in a very specific part of the world, but it can have a huge effect on very long-lived species. So there's are issues of concern. There's lots and lots of big questions left, though. So for example, is the anthropogenic mortality that we've seen, it's big. It's a large number. It scared a lot of people when we put it up. But is it additive or compensatory? And by additive, I mean it's extra. These are more birds than would have died naturally. Or is it compensatory? These birds would have died anyway. And that's a big question. It's a huge question. It's been one of the biggest challenges in biology for a long time. Is nest failure absolute? I'm going to show you 
what it, how much it matters if some chicks might make it in a given nesting attempt that's disturbed by us or any other activity. How often do birds re-nest? It's not actually something we understand for most of Canada. And do we properly estimate survival? So this is a paper that's not mine, but what it shows is population size on the x-axis and the number of collisions on the y-axis. And so the larger the population, the more birds of that species are likely to be colliding with windows. And the top we have towers and the bottom we have buildings. So this is a very strong relationship. As a population gets bigger, we get more collisions. Now in this paper, they then looked at relative collision vulnerability. So the birds that are above this line, they collide more than you would expect based on their abundance. The ones below, maybe they're better at avoiding it or they fly at lower heights, something like that. But then we looked at it relative to population, this paper looked at it relative to population trends and in fact found very little evidence that these patterns resulted, you know, the birds that were more vulnerable are more likely to have a declining population. So the argument of these this authors was that the mortality we're seeing was compensatory. These birds would have died anyway. Now there's great debate in the literature, you can read, it's quite fun debate, because um, many people argue about all the problems with this paper and everything else but it gets into highlights the issues we have to deal with. Is it additive? Is it compensatory? If it's compensatory, how much? Et cetera. Now, the other thing to remember is we do not understand nest failure worth a damn. We run out and we measure these things. We go to nests. We come back every three or four days. Yeah, well, I had to put something up to get your attention. <laughs> So the nests that go out there all the time, we measure them. And you guys, a lot of you are doing nest searching. If you are not religious about how you measure it, you will get the wrong answer. And what this table shows is how many nests, you know, very trained, PhD student levels, misidentified as being predated. All I really want to highlight from this is that if we look at population growth, lambda, one would be a stable population. Above one is growing and below one is declining. And if we look across, depending on how we define nest success and nest failure, our lambda changes quite a bit. We go from being, oh, this population's growing like crazy, to actually this population could be stable or even declining. And the reason being, in this case, this chick does not make it. And the squirrel took his head off. So, you know, it's, uh, it's an issue. But I've tons of videos here where a predator comes in, eats one, but the other three make it. Do they make it? I don't know, but they leave the nest. The predator didn't get them in the nest. So I think that same question asks itself, depending on when we time stuff, what we do may lead to some chicks making it, and how important is that? This, this graph just highlights another study. I won't go into detail, but the big thing, again, here's lambda. One is stable. We would have stable populations. Much of what we've modeled uses a single visit, uh, sorry, sorry, a single nesting attempt. If the nest fails, the bird is done. Well, that's not true. Birds will try and re-nest. They will move and try again. The question is how often? And what this shows is simply, you know, based on potential re-nesting sequences, you know, what lambda would do. And so, you know, lambda could be anywhere from massively declining to massively increasing depending on the re-nesting frequency. So this is something we just don't know. I also worry a lot about double dipping on mortality. So most of the way we understand adult and juvenile mortality is we put bands on birds and we let them fly away and then they come back and the proportion they come back, we use that as our survival estimate. We have no idea what killed them, where they died, right? So maybe all of them died from a, um, you know, a, a, from an anthropogenic event. And if that's the case, maybe the way we're estimating survival is being biased by the fact that we don't know what the natural rate is versus the anthropogenic. So one study where I actually do know the answer to this question is on Ferruginous hawks, where we can put a satellite transmitter on them, follow them for three years, and know exactly where they die and when they die. And of 31, eight out of 31 birds we've had have died. Of four of those uh, that we know what happened to them, three died from human activity, right? So exactly what proportion we're gonna add to human versus natural, right, has a huge consequence. Add to this that five out of 85 times the birds went somewhere completely different. We would never have found them if we were just doing banding. And you know, our certainty about adult mortality is an issue. Now, I don't think we can forget about legacy effects, even though I've made this talk go really long and I'm gonna have to skip through legacy effects really quick. But the idea of legacy effects is I'm very concerned, not so much that we, you know, we disturb nests and we destroy some nests in the, in the course of action of you know, clearing land or doing forest harvesting. 
if we don't remember that the habitat that the birds need has to be maintained as well. So in forest companies, they're really good at this. Um, so this is a graph basically showing um, the number of black-throated greens simulated into the future. This is a forest plan by LPAC in northeastern Alberta. This is what we know about the age of the forest, the type of the forest, and so black-throated greens like really old mixed woods. That's their favorite habitat. They don't mind spruce, or sorry, and mixed woods are good, and spruce is also okay. A bunch of other habitats, we'll never find them. So we're clearing this land, clearing being we're cutting the trees down and we're gonna let them regrow, but these birds are going to be constrained. They're going to be more limited for long-term production by the loss of habitat over the 80-year cycle than the number that we're probably going to disturb right there. And so I think we have to start thinking a lot more about that. Now, forestry right now, you guys, a lot of people are doing, you know, nest searches, they're using point counts to assess pre-harvest, and they're using density models, which Nicole will talk about. What I'm wondering, though, is how effective is that? Is that use of money to establish what is there the right way to go versus planning for, you know, long-term legacy effects for something like the black-throated green? So I think we've got to start incorporating incidental take with long-term planning. Right? How much lost productivity for the next five years, 10 years, 15 years are we going to have, not just what happens when I do this disturbance event. So here's my proposal, and I'm simply putting this up as a talking point. It's not, far, it's not any kind of recommendation or anything like that, but I'm going to start with this. If you're going to go out as a forester and are you going to log in the breeding season, I'm going to make this statement. You are going to destroy birds' nests, no matter what you do. How many, you can reduce the number, but you're still going to destroy some. So what should you do? Well, maybe you want to model and go to the place with the fewest nests. Then you should look at your habitat models and see what species. Are they species of concern that are likely there? Are they species that, you know, there's going to be a long-term legacy effect? Then we could do bird survey prior to harvest and make some decisions. If you've got a species with concern with really strong legacy risk, I'm going to say don't harvest. If it's a Canada warbler and it's a hot spot of them, why would we want to harvest there? That's a risk, a very big one. If we go, okay, it's an all-sided flycatcher, they can live in a cup block, but I don't want to disturb them in the year that they're there, maybe we should delay to fall winter. If it's species with a legacy risk, but there's lots of them left, maybe we assess and check against our plan to see if it makes sense from a modeling perspective. But there's lots of places where the birds that are there you know, are going to be tolerant the next year they'll be back in there and they'll be re-nesting. Maybe that's a different way of thinking of it. I just want us to have this discussion. I'm not saying this is the right solution, but I think it's an important thing that we start talking about. Now, I'll skip over this, but just to highlight, you know, this can be done by anybody now. We don't, as much as ornithologists love to go out and do this kind of stuff, timber cruisers can now do it with technology. One thing I'm also very worried about, and I think we also need to talk about, and would be good to talk about today, is the potential for perverse consequences. So this is a cliff swallow, and cliff swallows like to nest on bridges. They like to make these lovely med nests underneath the bridge. And if you're going to do a bridge maintenance, the recommendations that currently are out on much of the website and government literature suggest you may want to keep them off the bridge so that you don't disturb them. So in other words, the birds come, they try to set up at a bridge, we spray the bridge off every time they try to build a nest. We're not disturbing the nest because it hasn't been built yet. But that leads to the birds then leaving. And the premise is that's better for them. I don't think we have any evidence that that's true. If we do, I'd like to see it. But I'm worried that the cure is worse than the disease. So this is not a study I've done, but it's a proposed flowchart for making decisions about what we should do in that context. So I think we need studies. This is Adaptive Management 101. Go out there and let somebody do bridge maintenance with the cliff swallows underneath. If all the nests fall off, that's bad. We probably should keep them off and let them try to go somewhere else. But let's say the nests stay there, all right? Well, if the nests stay there, then let's go look at sublethal effects. Do the chicks come, you know, the chicks get disturbed more often. Do the nests, you know, are the nestlings coming out in worse body condition? Are the number of young leaving the nest a problem? Let's, you know, and that might be answer a question. If the cliff swallows, for example, though, if we force them to leave, we need to know what they do. Do they go somewhere else? Do they try to re-nest? Because we don't know that. And if we don't know that, are we just making a problem worse because they're getting no production out of that location? 
So I won't go through this in detail. You know, it'll be up later that people can look at it. But it's an I proposed kind of hypothesis diagram of what we would want to think about doing. So the last thing I want to highlight um, in my last five seconds is there are trade-offs here. There are lots and lots of trade-offs. Summer logging, if we stop it, for example, has social consequences, it has economic consequences, and it has ecological consequences. We are starting to see what the numbers look like. They need to be better. I'm not even going to pretend that these are right. But maybe this isn't such a big deal relative to Windows. What if, and I'm just throwing this again, it's not a do this, but what if, what if forestry said, okay, we are going to cause some incidental take. It's going to be, you know, something we want to try to do something about. Well, what if we put 200 million bucks or 10 million bucks or a million bucks into bird window awareness and we helped people reduce bird collisions at their houses? If that's 255 million versus 2 million, that's a huge right, kind of saver, right? We have to think about those numbers and where the biggest bang for our conservation buck might come from because I don't think we're going to stop incidental take everywhere. So just highlight, we need to be a little more holistic in what we're thinking about. I would argue that if there are costs to managing incidental take that take away from our ability to plan for legacy effects, we want to really look at those trade-offs. Due diligence, as you guys are going to talk about throughout this, important, this whole ses session, is important. But I'm going to argue that not violating the law to its strict absolute degree is going to be very difficult, if not impossible. And so finding ways to mitigate risk is good. But in my opinion, we should start putting them into larger scale landscape level processing, uh, landscape level planning processes to see where does the incidental take issue fit with my long term legacy risk from the habitat I disturb and, um, and replant and all of that kind of stuff. So with that, I will end and take any questions.